So next talk is by uh, Sushmita Adhikari from KIPAC, and the talk is on splashback radius and current observational developments. Hey, um, thank you for having me here. So I'll be talking about some recent work I've been doing on um, measuring the outskirts of galaxies, uh, basically the splashback radius. Uh, a lot of the work has been, um, a lot of the observational work has been led by a graduate student, uh, one of my collaborators at UPenn, Tay, and uh, these are the names of my other collaborators. Right, um, so I'll start at the beginning. Um, in general, we know that dark matter halos are um, basically bound serialized objects, uh, which are the endpoints of all structure formation in the universe, right? Uh, however, the boundary or the region of influence of a halo is somewhat murkily defined. Uh, for example, uh, this is a snapshot, this is a picture of a halo, and uh, this is a stack density profile of a bunch of halos, and depending on what you're interested in, there is actually a variety of ways in which you can define uh, the edge of a halo. And the different definitions, which have mostly been, uh, which are mostly based on uh, quantifying a certain overdensity over the background density of the universe, uh, can probe very different regions of the halo. For example, R500C can be here, uh, which is the radius where the enclosed overdensity is 500 times the uh, background critical density, or R200 matter, on the other hand, can be somewhere in the outskirts. However, if you look at halo evolution, if we uh, look at halo evolution in phase space, there's actually a very clearly physically motivated definition of a halo boundary. So this is a picture of a halo in phase space. Uh, this is an idealized case. It's a spherical accretion, um, spherical smooth accretion. Um, and the y-axis here is plotting the radial velocity, and the x-axis is plotting the distance, uh, the logarithmic distance from the halo center. So if you so a positive radial velocity basically means that things are going outwards from the center of the halo, and a negative radial velocity means that things are falling into the halo. So in what you see in space, basically, far outside the halo, at very large distances, you have a region where uh, things have positive radial velocity, that is, things are just moving outwards with the Hubble flow. Then you move on to small to inner regions of the halo where you have an infall stream or thing objects are falling into the halo with negative radial velocities for the first time. Uh, as you go closer to the halo, the radial velocities increase, uh, become further and further, uh, become higher and higher until it crosses over smoothly. Uh, this is when you've fallen into the halo, it crosses, crosses the center smoothly, uh, and it's now, and the shell of dark matter is now moving out from the center of the halo until it turns around in its first orbit um, for the first time, right? Or it splashes back into the halo. And this edge, this basically this first turnaround of the most recently accreted matter forms the edge of the multi-streaming or the orbiting region of the halo. So within this region, you have things which are on orbits or uh, shells that are crossing. And outside of this region, you, don't, you only have a single um, infall stream for the halo. So this region basically defines the phase space boundary of the dark matter halo. The density profile is essentially uh, a projection of an integration of uh, the phase space and the velocity direction. And so if you just take uh, the phase space and project it for this idealized case, and you project it to get the density profile, uh, you have density as a function of r. At the regions of these, at, at locations of these turnaround, you get, get these really sharp caustics in idealized simulations. Uh, that's because the radial velocities, they're turning around, so the radial velocity is approaching zero, so things spend a long, longer time over there. So you see these caustics, and the outermost caustic basically defines where the edge of your halo would be. Um, however, we don't always measure, uh, we actually cannot measure the exact 3D phase space of uh, dark matter halos in observations. What we can, however, measure is the density profiles of halos, and a few years back, uh, Benedict Diemer and Andre Kravtsov, uh, they were looking at simulations and stacked um, profiles of dark matter halos. Um, and on the top panel, I'm plotting the density versus radius. And on the bottom panel is a plot from their paper showing the slope of the density profile as a function of the radius from the halo center. And what they found was that, um, that in a narrow localized region near the outskirts of the cluster, 
the slope of the density profile can actually deviate quite significantly from what you generally expect from, uh, say, an NFW profile, where you expect the outer slope to go to minus 3. However, they found that the slope in this region can become minus 4 or even minus 5 in a very uh, narrow region. So uh, that was basically very intriguing to us. And um, we later followed up looking and comparing the slope profiles to the phase space of dark matter halos, uh, of stacked dark matter halos and n-body simulations, which are far from these idealized cases. But what we see is that this minimum in the slope of uh, the density profile actually traces uh, the phase space discontinuity um, in this picture. So the edge of the halo is actually traced by this, uh, by the minimum of the slope, and this is where we, this is what we call the boundary of the halo. And since this is the region where you, you're having the first turnaround of objects falling in, we call it uh, the splashback radius. So, uh, right. And what we also found uh, in our paper is that if you subselect on particles with low velocities, this feature becomes sharper. And that is because it's traced mostly by objects that are turning around at that location. Right. So um, the main dependencies of the location of the splashback radius um, was basically on the accretion rate of the halo, so how fast the halo is growing. The faster your halo is growing, um, the further out a particle can go in its first orbit. So if your potential is getting deeper and deeper, uh, the distance it moves out to on its first orbit is shallower. So fast accreting halos have a small splashback radius compared to high accreting, uh, compared to slow accreting halos of the same mass. And apart from the accretion rate dependence, we also found that the splashback radius should be a function also of the redshift, uh, just because it, uh, just because in, in units of R200, just because it uh, defines how quickly your background universe is expanding away. Right. So, um, right. So further, um, what we found here, further, I should note that uh, we were working with the splashback radius of dark matter particles, uh, which can basically be probed by uh, measuring the slope of the dark matter density profile, uh, which is essentially uh, which is something that you essentially measure using weak lensing. However, splashback also appears in subhalos. Subhalos follow exactly the same dynamics as uh, dark matter particles, uh, except that they feel dynamical friction. So very massive subhalos lose energy through dynamical friction and uh, splashback at smaller radius than more massive ones. So the splashback radius can act also act as a probe for dynamical friction. And in a later work, we also showed that it can be sensitive uh, to some models of modified gravity. Right. Um, I'll move on now to the observations of splashback radius. Um, the first observations of splashback radius were done by uh, Surhuth, uh, who you heard from yesterday. And um, he measured splashback radius using optical galaxy clusters uh, in the SGSS survey. So he used the red mapper cluster sample. Um, it was also further followed up by uh, Eric Baxter and also uh, in DES galaxies and DES clusters in both galaxy density and weak lensing uh, by Chiwei and Eric. Right, uh, so the idea is simple. What we measure um, is uh, we basically locate the clusters and send, use the cluster centers um, from optical cluster catalogs. And then we just measure the dense, number density of galaxies, which are known to live in subhalos, uh, as a function of radius. Uh, we model the projected number density of galaxies from the 3D densities. Uh, we have an inner ion astro like term, and we have a t uh, term which basically mimics uh, the transition region. and um, then we try to constrain uh, the splashback radius. So here is a plot of uh, the measured splashback from number density of halos from SDSS, uh, from Suruth's paper. And the main upshot of that was that um, we found that the location of the splashback radius uh, was about 20% smaller than what we expected from simulations. Uh, we found the same discrepancy in um, DES results as well. So uh, the green and red curves are from uh, subhalos and simulation, and the black is for, from measurements. And we found the same discrepancy in uh, weak lensing measurements around these clusters as well, although uh, it's noisier. 
So the outstanding problems that remain was this 20% discrepancy. Apart from that, we also did not see um, any evidence for dynamical friction. That is, we did not see any movement of this radius with the galaxy magnitude, and um, which we expect to correlate with subhalo mass. And what we also didn't see is any redshift evolution, but that I think is expected if we don't uh, stack on accretion rate. Right. Um, so we wanted to probe why this splashback radius uh, is discrepant from simulations. So there could be several reasons. Uh, we looked at dynamical friction. Could it be new physics? But more likely than not, it is some sort of an observational bias, um, especially because we are using uh, red mapper clusters, uh, which suffer from projection effects. Orientation effects, these red mapper clusters may be more oriented, or the major axis may be oriented towards us. And other effects like aperture selection, because you're uh, already choosing an aperture, you might be introducing, to define the mass of these clusters, you might be introducing a feature in your profile. So what we did is we tried uh, an alternative. So to look at this last effect, we tried an alternative cluster selection method. Uh, so we, instead of looking at these optical clusters, which are, um, which are, which define cluster mass based on the richness or the number of galaxies. We looked at um, SZ selected clusters, which is a completely independent way of probing cluster, uh, of finding clusters and uh, uses a different scaling relation to measure the mass of clusters. Uh, clusters are seen as temperature decrement and SCMB, as you've heard before today. And, um, right, and, we used the centers of these SZ clusters, and we basically correlated the SZ cluster field with the black background density field from DES. Um, so we used SPT clusters, uh, which overlaps with DES in this region. Most of, most of the survey overlaps with DES, and we also use uh, the ACT clusters. And we use the DES uh, year three galaxy density field. Right. Um, so for these, for the different selection of uh, clusters, what we found is that uh, the splashback radius, which is the red uh, shaded region over here, is more or less consistent with what we get from simulations, especially with the particle profile. When we measure the particle splashback radius, we find that they match almost exactly with uh, the galaxy density profile. The location from the subhalo is um, consistent with what we get from these SE clusters. However, the inner regions of the subhalo profiles from simulations are subject to a lot of um, disruption effects, so we don't really trust it beyond this region. Um, so these are the results from SPT and ACT, uh, both of which are consistent with what we are getting from simulations. However, when we can compare SPT and Red Mapper, uh, we still find a discrepancy, although it's not largely significant. So even though our SPT results are consistent with simulations, they're also consistent. The location of the feature is also consistent with red mapper to one sigma. Um, however, I'd, I'd like to point out that even though the location of the splashback feature itself is uh, different, uh, the, the entire profile of the red mapper and SPT are uh, quite significantly different from each other. And uh, it is something worth trying to pinpoint why that's happening. Right, so this is a summary of the different measurements of uh, the splashback radius. And uh, finally, uh, in the last two slides, I'd also like to focus on another way uh, of how we can use the splashback radius uh, to learn about galaxy evolution. We can use the splashback radius basically as a clock. So if you take a population of galaxies and you see a splashback feature in them, it basically tells you that those galaxies have been inside the halo for at least one um, orbit, or at least they've at least reached the first turnaround or apocenter in their orbits. So, for example, if you uh, assume that galaxy quenching inside of halos is something which depends on how long a galaxy has been inside a halo, uh, you'd expect that galaxies, uh, if, if galaxies quench very fast before they reach pericenter of their orbits, uh, you would not expect to see a splashback feature in them. Whereas if galaxies have been around in the halo and have reached uh, splashback, you would expect to see a splashback feature in them. So what we do, uh, because we know that quenching correlates with galaxy color, uh, we, we split our galaxy sample into different colors and try to measure uh, the splashback radius. And what we find is that the bluest galaxies, which uh, is basically de defined as the 20th percentile of the colors, uh, we don't see any splashback feature. However, uh, Green galaxy uh, for the we, we do see a splashback out to like these green galaxies. So at least some 
uh, star formation is taking place even out to uh, the apocenter radius, whereas we do uh, isolate an infall stream, a purely infall stream in the bluest galaxies. Right, um, so I think I'm out of time, so I'll, I'll just leave the conclusions up and take any questions. Thank you. <laughs>